Listeners, welcome to the Business Method Podcast today. And our guest is a very impressive individual who is the co-founder of Embark Trucks, a company that recently completed a merger with $5 billion. His name is Alex Rodriguez, and get this, he is only 26 years old. His company, Embark, is setting a precedent for self-driving semi-trucks around the world. Alex is going to talk with us about building this company and changing the world one self-driving semi-truck at a time. Alex, welcome to the podcast. How are you today, man? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me, Chris. Awesome. So uh, for those of you not watching on the video, Alex has this cool background of his factory and his trucks in the background. And um, I always thought, you know, uh, a self-driving semi truck might stand out and look different than other semi trucks. I don't know why I thought that, and maybe I thought it would be like a space vehicle. But, but your <laughs> trucks look like any any average day to day semi trucks on the road, right? There's there's not much difference between the style of your truck and and the other trucks that are out there. Yeah, well, actually, one of the the pretty cool things about the way we built the tech is it's designed to be platform agnostic so it doesn't care about what the underlying powertrain is and so you actually have uh in the photo behind me two different trucks from two different manufacturers which we're in the process of installing the system on for different fleets uh so i'm sure we'll get into that at some point but there you go that's your fun fact for the day absolutely um i really want to dive into the nut and nuts and bolts of embark and then building uh the company and the technology that you guys are focused on which i think is thoroughly impressive but you've got a really cool background story. And I um, sometimes I touch on this with entrepreneurs and other times I don't. But I was reading through kind of your background and I thought it was just cool. Like I just needed to mention it. Um, first off, I think uh, and let me know if I don't have this correct. But basically, you're still living. You're living in a, in a, a house with roommates and you don't have Instagram and you live like just an average 26 year old, you know, does it, you know, that's not any different because you have this huge company that's changing the world. Um, is that true? Uh, well, so I finally got Instagram, but, uh, <laughs> Congratulations. but I still live with my co-founder, uh, in an apartment in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And, uh, have you got TikTok yet? No, no, nah. I'm holding out. You can stay. I held out until <laughs> just recently, man. It took me a while, but finally, I somebody's pushed me over the edge that's cool yeah i'm usually like five years late to any given social trend so i try to you know <laughs> kind of like that as be well. behind. <laughs> i'm kind of you know in in the entrepreneurial world if you have your own business and you're not building a personal brand then you know sometimes it doesn't really it just takes away from your time and energy of focusing on your business yeah well one of the things i i have done is i have uh like all social apps off my phone for example and like i think that's you know a key piece of how you get stuff done. <laughs> I think so too, man. It, it takes a lot of your time and energy. And, um, you know, we talk about high performance on the podcast regularly and we'll dive in. And I think you've got some pretty cool tips, but we'll dive into some of that more, but you have, so you, you don't have any social apps. You just got Instagram and then you keep those off your, off your phone. I like to turn my phone off before bed. And typically I don't get back on my phone until noon the next day. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. I call it my phone timeout session. I don't, do you do you do anything? Do you put your phone on screen time or limit time on any apps or anything like that? Yeah, pretty uh, not by time of day, but uh, so like I said, I have pretty much everything that's not transactional off, and then I have like five minutes max for Safari. Uh -huh. That's my that's my use for the phone. So I try to make it so that you only I only use it to like go in and do a thing and come out, right? And anything that you can just sort of uh, scroll forever try it try not yeah. to have there yeah it's and it's bad dopamine right there's good and bad dopamine we don't want the bad dopamine it comes from the social <laughs> media apps. I, I think the one thing that's kind of funny is like uh i don't know it, it sounds like something you would do honestly like with parental controls so like a, a kid mm -hmm. but it just makes life easier like not having to make that decision all the time right yeah and the, and the stress levels are significantly lower too i guess for myself and other people that i've worked with too but um it's just nice not to have that constant nagging of social media and apps on your phone all the time saying, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me, check in. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm busy enough with uh, with just the self driving truck. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I also heard that you decorate your bedroom with Legos. Is that true? I don't know if that's exactly accurate, but but okay. I certainly have many Legos. <laughs> yeah, well, you're um, a builder, right? Yeah. So when I when I first did robotics, I was eleven, uh, and I did a couple of years of Lego Mindstorms. Um, I don't know if you if you know what that is. Uh-uh. Okay, it's like uh, you can build these little Lego robots. It's like it's not the brick kind you're thinking of. There's like a sort of like the next iteration of Lego. And there's a big competition. There's like 10, 12,000 teams uh, of middle school, high schoolers, well, mostly middle schoolers. Yeah. Um, And they'll do, they'll do big international competitions. And this is how I first got into robotics. Wow. That's cool, man. And, and then also, so let's see, you won, let's see, was it your high school competition for building a a self-driving go-kart? Is that correct? (laughs) <laughs> I think you're, you're merging maybe a couple of different stories together okay. there. So, okay. so I, so I mentioned I did, so I did this thing called first robotics, which is a bunch of different levels. And that's what the, the Legos were kind of like the junior level. Yeah. And then, um, I won the robotic world championships when I was 15, which is a high school competition. Okay. Uh, that was fun. Uh, and <laughs> then separate, like, yeah, still, uh, like probably, probably one of the top days of my life. Uh, even, okay. even to the present. Um, and then separately, in when I was in university, uh, myself and my co-founder at Embark, Brandon, built the first self-driving vehicle to go on public roads, which was this golf cart uh, that drove itself. Wow. Incredible. So what does one have to do to win a world's robotic championship? It's hard. <laughs> yeah. There's about 2,000 teams uh, all around the world. You like there's regional level competitions. So you have to win your regional, and then you get invited to worlds. And then worlds is uh, sort of the top teams, uh, and they'll the the games are two on two or three on three, uh, and you'll build these. They're like metal. They're part autonomous, part remote controlled, mm-hmm. and they'll play like two minute matches. And it's like a elimination style bracket, like you'd see in sort of any sport. Uh, and you know you you got to do a combination of working super hard. Like I used to wake up at 6 a.m. before school and do like an hour and a half of, of testing the robot. Cause, mm-hmm. oh yeah. Cause the field was in my parents' living room. My mom okay. like allowed us to put the 12 by 12 fe- foot field in the living room. And so I'd wake up, come downstairs, do robotics for an hour and a half, go to school, come back, keep working on the, the system. Um, and then you also got to get lucky. Like, let's be honest, like any, you know, multi-thousand team competition, you got to get lucky if you're going to win. Yeah. Well, I mean, luck, but also a great product, right? Yeah. You, I mean, you got to do both. <laughs> yeah. um, Necessary, but not sufficient. I also read too, Alex, that you and your dad, your dad has a similar mind to you. Like he likes to build and engineer things and that you and him would build and engineer um, different products when you were young and uh, create business ideas from this. Is that right? Yeah, so my dad does something a little different. So he's um, the CEO of an advertising company in Canada. Okay. Like a 70-ish person advertising company. Um, You know, like uh, you go to the grocery store and you put like a divider between your groceries and the next person's groceries on the the conveyor belt. So he has the patent on putting ads in that. And all across Canada, uh, they'll put ads in those things and sell them. And that's his business. Nice. Um, So it's like... It's like not sort. Of, it's like one of those like businesses that you don't really think of day to day, but you know, employs a bunch of people and, and it's a pretty cool business. Right. Um, and yeah, when, we, when I was young, uh, we used to keep a journal uh, of like instead of bedtime stories, he would uh, we do like basically business model like things. So I, I I'd have an idea, and he'd wow. be like, "Well, how many how many marketing people do you need?" And I'd be like. And we figured that out and like, well, how much is that going to cost? Like, okay, well, wow. how's that going to affect your margins? And we work out the margins. You'd be like, okay, we need a new idea. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Like, uh, you know, they say that you have 20,000 um, conversations with the financial advisor before you turn 18 and that's your parents or the people that are raising you. 
And um, it may be great advice and it may be horrible advice, but I always notice that people that come from entrepreneurial families, quite often their parents are teaching them the principles of entrepreneurship at a young age. And it sounds, that sounds, I don't have kids yet, but I think I'm going to have them do what your dad did for you is keep a journal and talk about business bedtime stories. Uh <laughs> well, I think the most useful thing about, about growing up with entrepreneurs as parents is I think a lot of people really don't have an intuition for how you bridge the gap from like a personal project to a business, right? They've okay. never seen that in between stage. Um, and so every, a lot of, uh, even in Silicon Valley, a lot of founders will start out trying to copy the mature businesses that they've seen around them. Mm -hmm. Right. But in reality, that's not how it works. Uh, in between there's this like liminal stage where it's like a pretty serious project but it's more a project than a business right um, and i think that was like sort of knowing how you you cross that gap like because i saw my parents doing you know doing everything really by hand doing uh the, the paul graham uh do things that don't scale uh yeah. mantra where like my mom had the first so these bars right the very first ones of them uh she you know they got a few thousand and they were literally like her and a few parents from the school, like putting them, putting the ads into the bars in our basement, packing them up, taking them to the first grocery stores, like kind of, you know, doing it by hand as if you were doing, you know, preparing for like a major trip or a major event. Um, and you sort of saw then how you scaled and scaled from there. But you realize that, you know, at first it's just, you know, a handful of people doing something in your basement. That's where it starts. Yeah. Absolutely. And for so many entrepreneurs and businesses that have succeeded and failed, that's how it all started, right? People selling out of their basement or garage or had a hobby of creating something. What What would you see, say, Alex, or maybe this is something you learned from your father. Um, you mentioned the intuitive knowledge or uh, to know how to take the idea and put it into a business model. Um, what is that that you learned from your father and how do you apply it now? I think uh, one of the things that is really important in designing a, a product or a business um, is really having a passion for creating value for other people. Um, I think this can get lost, especially actually in robotics, the, obviously the industry that, that we work in today, um, where people are really into technology and they love technology and they'll sort of have this technology that, and then go looking for a place to use it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's really critical is you need to solve for two things when you're creating a business. Um, one, it needs to be something that you can build. And so I think that there it's very important to understand the technological constraints. Yeah. Um, but you also need to solve for something that creates a lot of value for other people. And sometimes that means, for example, um, us choosing to focus on trucking because it has a big problem in the form of the driver shortage um, because you're able to produce a lot more value per vehicle. And so you're able to get a lot better economics out of it mm -hmm. uh, versus going and trying to work on robo taxis, for example, which are both technically harder, but also have like much worse economic fundamentals. Um, and I think that, you know, that almost goes back to that uh, entrepreneurial journal, right? Like you need to do the back of the envelope. Does the product I'm providing, cost less than the value it's creating. Otherwise I need to think, think again about what I'm doing here. <laughs> so say that again, that that's a great business principle there. Does the product that I'm providing or building cost less than the, um, what was the last part the value, the, the, it's the value it's creating? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if this is an amazing business principle. I just said you should have positive margins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> well put though, like sometimes it just needs to be said a little bit differently to, to, to soak up, you know, for people, because, you know, again, like we go back to the idea nine out of 10 businesses fail. Why is that? Because no positive margins or there's not a need for the product or service, you know? Um, I do think one, one like tip that I've come across that's really, really helpful is people are in well, at least people who are the type of entrepreneurs that go out to raise funding, which is obviously sort of a subset of entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. um, have this terrible habit of 
trying to figure out what the total addressable market is by like looking up research studies and then saying, ah, oh, yes, the TAM of healthcare is $2 trillion, right? Which no one cares about. Right. A- and uh, one of the things I was taught actually by Sequoia, who's one of our early investors, is that the way to understand both gross margin and market size is just to think about the target customer. Like who would buy this and how much would they pay for it? Right. So in our case, we look at how many trucks are there, right? And how much value do we create per truck? Yeah. And you can then estimate very easily what is the total market size from the value per truck and the number of trucks. Uh, and also you can look at, okay, to my one customer, how much value am I creating? And also how much is it going to cost, right? And you can kind of do that. Like what is the what is the unit economics literally for one customer? And then how many customers are there? And that's the market, right? The market isn't like healthcare two trillion or transportation four trillion or whatever. The market is how many trucks are there and how much value do we create per truck? Okay, that's the total size of the value creation opportunity. I love that, um, Alex. When did you realize that you you were going to dive into the self driving semi truck world and obsess about it and grow a business? Um. I'd say it came piece by piece. Like we started out doing self-driving for fun because I thought it was by far the coolest application of robotics that existed. Yeah. Um, And then from there decided that it would become a business when we realized we'd sort of made a pretty good amount of progress and we were actually one of the leading efforts. So back in 2015, we built the first, uh, self-driving vehicle for public roads in Canada. It was this golf cart. Um, and at the time, there really weren't a lot of self-driving companies. It was kind of Google self-driving. There was a small startup called Cruise. Uber had just started, and that was pretty much it. Um, and so we were you know, one of the handful of first programs really to get started on this. Um, and so we realized it was a unique opportunity uh, to go and, and turn it into a business, which is exciting. And then the third piece was coming up with trucks as a market. Uh, and I think trucking is that's sort of the the cornerstone of what makes Embark unique is that we identified trucking early. And really, a lot of the elements of self-driving trucks as a concept uh, have been pioneered by us over the years, which is pretty cool. Like it, you start, you know, napkin sketching some of these ideas. And then today, it's not just something that we say. It's something that pretty much everyone says, for example, the use of transfer hubs. So instead of going into the city center, uh, we stop at the edge at a parking lot and it's adjacent to the highway, drop the trailer and then pick up a new trailer and go back. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that lets you just focus on sort of driving outside of city centers. Um, And this was like a crazy idea we had back in the day that that was part of how we decided to do trucking. Um, But today it's pretty standard and even our competitors have have adopted uh, these ideas. It makes a lot of sense. Um, And then you guys were, were, pretty young when you identified this, right? You were like 19, 18 years old when you said, you know, trucks are the the route that we're going to go because nobody's doing anything with it. And it's going to add such a huge value to really change the world, but change an industry. Yeah. I think it was, I think it was 20 when we started working on trucks. Okay. Yeah. And, um, was it just that, was there something specific about, I, you know, because I would say most 20 year olds would would think to themselves, yeah, a self-driving car would be awesome or motorcycle or even plane. Um, but for a 20 year old to come up with like, we're going to dive into the self-driving semi truck world. Uh, what was it about that? Is it just the value that was there? Nobody had touched it yet. Or what was it? So it was actually really systematic. So like I mentioned, we, we'd kind of been into the technology for a while. Um, and we, we did a really systematic review of uh, what are all the what are all the customers that this would benefit? How much value does this create for each of them? Does it fit with the technical capabilities of the system today? Mm-hmm. And it wasn't just trucking. So we looked into all sorts of places, um, whether that was mining or it was shuttles or it was taxis or it was um, you know buses. We really looked at a whole bunch of different things, and this one uh, came out sort of on top. I have a uh, I have a philosophy that I like. Uh, I call, I call it three, three, three for thinking about business ideas. You can kind of think about it as there's things that you can do in three hours, which is mostly research, like Mm -hmm. desktop research. 
There's things that you can do in three weeks, which is mostly calling people. And then there's things you can do in three months, which is build a prototype and actually see and actually try and sell it. Uh, and I kind of think of that as like the three gradations of how you can get more information about business ideas. And I've like done that, uh, you know, with with friends as well when they're working on on different ideas. And we basically did this, right? We did we did the desktop work. We figured out which ones were plausible, uh, and then we we filtered it down to a very small number. And then we went out and we called people, and we did the next layer of the exercise and talked to customers. And then we filtered it down further, mm -hmm. and then we decided on trucking, and and we built the company. And then there's the rule of the three year. Uh, it, it, like you always think that you can do more in a year than you really can, but you can often do much more in three years than you think you can. Have you heard that one? I, I haven't heard that, but that sounds right. Yeah, it sounds about right. Um, <laughs> so, so you get the ideas to d dive into the trucking industry and, and so what was the next step for you guys? I mean, obviously you've got to build a prototype. How, how'd that process go? So, uh, so to, to rewind a little bit, we, we built this, this shuttle prototype. Um, we came to San Francisco, we got into Y Combinator. We did a whole cycle with through Y Combinator. Um, we raised a couple million dollars. Then we did this systematic review and ultimately settled on trucking. So by the time that we, we bought our first truck, we had $2 million of seed funding, uh, and we were full time and we were in San Francisco. Um, and then the next step was, uh, it, it was interesting though, because, uh, obviously we, we had to, it, this was like a pretty significant pivot. We had to bring along, um, all of the people that had supported us, including all, all of our seed investors, uh, to say, Hey, you, you know, we started out with shuttles. We did this review. We think really the thing to do is work on trucks. Um, but obviously a different vehicle platform. And we kind of had to, to earn people's confidence that we knew what we were doing and that we would be able to execute on this different vehicle platform. And so we had this very detailed plan that basically laid out the eight months from when we pivoted to trucks to how we were going to have a truck on public roads, self-driving. Uh, and then we just went out and executed against it. And it was, you know, buy a truck, lease a space, get the brakes working, get the steering working, get the perception working, get a track and it's sort of this full list and also do hire our first employees. Um, and so by February of 2017 or thereabouts, uh, we executed all this. We'd run the truck on, on public roads, uh, in Nevada. Uh, we like released a video and, and that was when we launched it marked publicly. Was there ever a moment for you guys that you thought that like this, this seemed absolutely impossible because it does seem like a, a massive thing for a couple 20 year olds to take on or guys in their twenties. Um, you know, but obviously getting into the, the Y Combinator and a Teal Fellowship, you know, catapulted and helped you guys along. But w was there resistance for you guys ever? Um, it's a, it's a inter it's an interesting question because I think it it assumes a slightly different perspective on what we were doing than the one we actually had at the time. Okay, which is the perspective we had at the time is I don't see why it wouldn't work. Like, why it would or would not? Why it would not. Okay. I'm, I can't confidently tell you why it would not work. And we're going to go find out and it'll be fun. Uh -huh. uh, and so I don't necessarily think that – I think one of the things about taking on the type of problem that we're taking on, um, which like – self-driving is never been done before by anyone anywhere in the world, regardless of money or PhDs or whatever. Right. Right. Um, but it seems like it's probably going to happen. Right. Um, that was kind of our view, our viewpoint. Uh, and so I, I think to really tackle those really hard problems, um, the possibility of it not working out is something you have to be pretty comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And you're like, this will be, this would be a worthwhile and interesting endeavor and I believe that it has a good chance of being successful. And that's why we're doing it. That was kind of the, the feeling. Um, I, I don't think we went into it with the idea that this will certainly be successful or this must be successful for this to have been a good use of our time. And so we never really uh, asked the question like, 
well, might it not work? Like, obviously it might not work. Uh, yeah. that, that was the framing. <laughs> might yeah. it work was kind of what we were thinking. We're like, it might work. <laughs> that was the, that was the perspective. <laughs> yeah. It'll likely work. So let's just try and see what happens. You know, let's, right. right. Um, and then, it, so you dropped out of college to go to move to San Francisco and, and continue to pursue this. Um, what was the the moment for you when you realized, okay, college isn't going to be my thing. We're going to go to San Fran and, and make this thing, you know, get into Y Combinator, make this thing work and build this company. Yeah. Well, I like college. Uh, I, I'm a Teal fellow, but I'm not like a, uh, I, I'm not, I, I don't necessarily agree with Peter in the view that college is bad. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I think college is mostly good. Um, and so it wasn't so much that I was like, oh, I don't like college. I'm going to drop out because I don't like college. It was, um, I, I think building stuff is really interesting. I love building stuff. I did all through college, even like since I was 11, long before college, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there was a summer when I was a kid one time where I was like, mom, I want to build a autonomous lawnmower. And we just like went around and like bought stuff at like Home Depot. And so I could try and turn that into an autonomous lawnmower. Nice. Um, so I've been doing this like, you know, forever. Um, I think building stuff is what it's all about. And then it just so happened that we built something that was very clearly at the cutting edge of something that was going to be really important. Yeah. Um, and if we had stayed in school for the three years, it would have taken from that point. Uh, then I don't think it would have been cutting edge. And so we would have kind of lost this incredibly cool opportunity. And so we dropped out because we had this opportunity and we wanted to be able to pursue it. Yeah. And, you know, going through Y Combinator and being a Teal fellow, like you're learning so much and building this company, you're learning so much anyway. Like you're, you're. Oh yeah. And the argument was, you know, go, going to YC is what I would have hoped to have done after graduating from a robotics engineering degree, anywho. Uh -huh. And so like, let's go and do it now. Uh, and that'll be such amazing and exciting experience. And, like, and it might work. Uh, yeah. that, that, that was basically the thesis. <laughs> um, what was it like? I've had a handful of friends go through Y Combinator. Um, what was it like for you guys uh, being accepted and going into that program? Yeah, it was pretty high stakes, right? Uh, the whole interview process is pretty, uh, is pretty intense. Um, and obviously we were, we were super young and we'd actually committed to dropping out whether or not we got into YC, mm -hmm. um, which made getting into YC pretty important because that was pretty helpful. <laughs> um, and I would say some people will now, so now today, obviously I live in San Francisco. I hang out with founders a lot. Um, people now will often say, oh, I don't see what value YC brings. Um, I'm like, sure, yeah, you don't because you are a VC and you you hang, you have like five friends that could give you a seed check, mm -hmm. uh, if right. But if you're a 20 year old from Canada who knows no one, yeah, um, the the two things that it brings are instant network, right? The ability to go out and raise a seed fund from credible people, um, and also just a, a lot of believing in yourself. Like, I don't know that we ever had any huge change in strategy driven by talking to the partners at YC. Mm -hmm. um, usually we describe the problem and they'd like, you know, pressure test our thinking and maybe we'd refine it a little bit, but broadly we go in the same direction we've been going anyway, but it was hugely helpful to have the confidence of being able to go and talk to the best in the business, the people who supported, whether it's Airbnb or Stripe or, Dropbox or whatever, mm -hmm. um, and have them go, yeah, that seems about right. And you're like, okay, cool. Like I didn't do anything crazy. Like, let's go do this. Yeah. Um, was there a moment, Alex, um, while you were in YC or, or was there a defining moment for you guys when you thought like, oh shit, this thing's really going to work. We've got a lot of eyes on it. People are really inspired by it. They want to support it. Was there like a tipping point for you guys when you you thought to yourself, this is this is a thing and it's going to happen? Mm, it would have been definitely would have been much later, right? Uh, I think the 
it it's always been abundantly obvious to me that um the demand is there for the yeah. product um i think what's been really exciting for me is when we got to the point where oh yeah this this actually works uh this is going to work uh from a technical perspective and that's that's really where i think it uh the rubber hits the road where was it when was that moment there are probably a few. I think the very first one was we had uh, we had this goal to run a loop around the Bay Area. So we laid out this loop that was like a, a, maybe an hour and a half on the 101 and the 280. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did this entire loop in a truck, self-driving, without the human touching the wheel. Uh, and so it was doing like lane changes and merges and dealing with traffic. Uh, and when we first completed that run, so it was actually, it was actually a good story. I don't think I've ever told this story before. Um, we had this goal. We sort of knew we were getting close, um, cause we were doing this loop all the time. We, but we'd have a few here or there where the driver would have to like take over. Um, but I kind of knew we were getting close. Uh, and so my co-founder and our safety driver were out doing the loop. And instead of going home this night, I just like hung out on one of the hammocks on the patio, uh, just like waiting for the truck to come back. Mm-hmm. So I was like pretty sure. And I did this for a few nights. Uh, and then they finally came back and be like, yeah, we did it. And we watched the video and like uh, it does this entire, you know, hour and a half loop without anybody touching the wheel. Uh, and that that was pretty exciting. This was, this was I think, in 17. Uh, and they're like, oh, yeah, this this is like this tech is actually going to work. Wow. How much, um, it's, it's kind of a thinking about how to phrase this, how, how much of the tech comes from you and your co-founder and then how much of it would you say comes from other sources or other people that have been involved in the company to really build this thing out? Because, you know, so many entrepreneurs like our, just our job is to hold the vision and then to bring in the team to build the thing, right? And and sometimes like the entrepreneur is in uh, in the weeds of you know Elon Musk is at Tesla every single day. You're at your factory now. I'm I'm guessing, um, you know. And then some people are just there and they're not as present as much, but they're holding the vision and they're building a team. So how how does that work out with you guys? Yeah, I w- I would say. Um, our job is, so er, very early on, my co-founder and I obviously did a lot of actual building. Mm-hmm. I would say today we've hired people who know a heck of a lot more than we do in each of the individual sub areas, right? We have a lot of PhDs in like individual parts of, of what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say our job is to know enough to be able to set the strategy and to be able to call bullshit, which I think is a really important mm-hmm. part of our industry. It's very different than like if you're building a website, right? If you're yeah. building a website, like it's a well-established, uh, it's well-established how to do it. You can just hire people who've done it before and you're not going to end up like going really far down like dead ends. Whereas yeah. um, because self-driving is something that's never been done before, uh, you really have to, be very thoughtful about how do you constrain the problem, what things are you going to pursue, what things are you not going to pursue. Um, and I think one of the things I've seen go quite badly at sometimes some of the bigger companies is they have senior executives who can't call bullshit. And so their technical strategy doesn't hold up to like medium quality rigor mm-hmm. um, because there isn't somebody who's able to to do that when hiring or when setting strategy. And so I would say we are not responsible. We have incredibly smart people who work very hard to actually write the code or machine the parts or do the designs. Um, Brandon and I are mostly responsible for making sure that the scope and the set of things we're going to invest in and the people that we hire all pass muster and are strategically aligned towards what we're trying to do. I'd like to chat a bit about um, the relationship with, with your business partner. Um, You know, you guys are living together. You guys are in your 20s. You had this vision from childhood, really, to create this. And it's working. It's an incredible. It's like, you know, it's one of, um, 
It's a story that becomes a movie eventually, or at least a book for sure. But uh, um, how do you guys maintain your business relationship and friendship while being in the weeds of building this company at the same time? I think with the right person, it just kind of works. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's, it, we're certainly um, pretty thoughtful about segmenting sort of, or compartmentalizing like personal versus work. Um, and so I think that's pretty helpful. Um, and I would say working with your friends is a, a complicated trade-off. One that I think on net is very positive. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's a complicated trade-off. Um, and I've seen this, uh, I've seen this go both ways. Like I, I've had to fire my close friend because it wasn't working professionally. Uh, and that's terrible. Uh, but the upside is that, um, like with, with me and Brandon, we have uh, a very close friendship from literally we were, uh, in the same residence in college. Uh, and so we've kind of been roommates on and off for seven years to since before the company, um, and, uh, it's, it's, I think it's really cool. It's cool to be able to have, um, I think a lot of people say being a CEO is lonely. Uh, and my experience isn't really like that. Uh, I think having sort of a close group of people that you're friends with first before you were professional co uh, colleagues, like puts things in perspective in a, in a pretty cool way. Yeah. I, I agree too. Like, I think if you, if you can manage a business with a co-founder, it just increases the depth of your, your, your friendship. But again, it needs to be maintained like any relationship. And most people don't want to take the time and energy to maintain it. They'd rather just call the shots, right. And be the lonely CEO for the most part. But, um, right. You got to, uh, you got to do your Sunday night game of Thrones and Indian food. Keep that, uh, that's that's I'm going to put that on the list Sunday night Game of Thrones and Indian food. <laughs> uh, we've been doing some uh, some metaverse games, so we'll hop in and play like golf or mini golf or or something on the metaverse, which will kind of like, you know, increase our our fun time together. Um, yeah, this is so I've asked the other founders that have come on the podcast, Alex, um, if you could um, title the phases of the growth of this business for chapters in a book. What would those chapters be? Uh, it's really interesting. Um, okay. So for context, for those listening, it marks about 350 people today and we went public, uh, almost a year ago, uh, today. Uh, so that's like kind of the, the current size. And then obviously we started in, 2016 maybe 15 well, so one of the things i uh, will do your exercise but okay. uh, just just jumping back to the very beginning there's an interesting piece of embark which i wonder if you've ever seen it in other places where it's actually really hard to pin a date on the start of the company mm -hmm. um pe people ask me this and i'll be like well officially we incorporated it in january of 2016 but all of the founders were there before that we built the golf cart before we incorporated the company. Uh, we had the name of the business for a different product idea with similar people before we built the golf cart. And it just keeps kind of going backwards to the point where you're like, no, there's no continuity between the very first thing yeah. and what we do today, but it sort of evolved bit by bit where you got, okay, we got the people and then we got the name and then we got the, the legal entity and then we got the business model. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. I mean, feel free to, time, right? yeah, feel free to break those down in different chapters because quite often a business is an evolution of many different things happening and even other businesses being a part of that and not succeeding or partially succeeding. So yeah. Okay. So, so I would go, there's probably, um, uh, I, I, I would, if, if I was going to give it a title, I'd call it the prototype mm -hmm. and this would be, um, 2015, basically sort of the self-driving golf cart, which was initially a summer project and some of the stuff that happened before that, uh, at our, uh, sort of entrepreneurship focused residence at Waterloo. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was just, uh, a com different projects were a combination of myself, 
uh, Brandon, my co-founder, and then a guy named Mike Stupian. Um, so the three of us sort of working on that. Then the next one would probably be called Y Combinator. And that would be, we went and did, uh, we sort of dropped out, did Y Combinator, took us six months. Um, then I would probably have one called The Pivot. We're still four people for this whole thing. This is like sort of winter of 16 to spring of 16. And then I call it The Pivot. So uh, spring of 16 to maybe winter of seven, 2017. Mm-hmm. And that would be the just the like evaluating all these different ideas, settling on trucking, laying out the plan, executing against the plan, hiring our first people. So we were eight people ish at the end of sort of this period. Um, so that'd be chapter three, then probably chapter four, probably chapter four would be, uh, like I, I, maybe I'd call it like building or like getting down to getting down to business or something like that. Okay. And this would be like winter of 2017. There are a lot of different ways you could carve it up, but I almost think that you would go all the way through until, just before 2020 or maybe and so we had like a long period of sort of being able to focus on building um focus on hiring uh and during this period we raised our series a from dcvc our series b from sequoia and our series c from tiger Mm -hmm. um and things were relatively straightforward and up and to the right uh and I, i i like say relatively obviously is like a you know there was a ton of stuff that went on during this period but with the benefit of retrospect there was uh in between that sort of long period it was really focused on on technology and it was cool that we were able to to mostly focus on technology and then i think covid was its own period we had obviously being a extremely in-person company like you have to build trucks like yeah it's a very physical business and so um i think covid was a big part uh and then um the spac uh which was about a year uh that ended a year ago and then now being public spec was a merger for the that audience. was sort of the, the process to go public yeah yeah um okay um what I found interesting and really surprising, but it makes a lot of sense, especially why people would want to invest in this and grow it um, more than just, hey, this is incredible technology that will change the world, is that it's it's largely also a, a SaaS company. And and you guys are automating trucking by embedding this software, uh, this operating system into trucks. And, and so, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, your software can get embedded into trucks that are already on the road and then it allows them to be, um, autonomous driving, self-driving trucks. Is that correct? Yeah. So maybe the best way to, to, to explain how it works is sort of to describe, um, what we're calling the truck transfer program, which is, mm-hmm. uh, the, something that we've been doing over the course of 2022 and it's going to result in the first trucks in a major fleet uh, that are actually owned and operated by that fleet. And so I think that's this is a big step for the industry and it really illustrates how this is all, how this all comes together. So it started out with us and the fleet um, sitting down. Uh, we'd done a whole bunch of prep work for to understand their network and where they would want to deploy this and, and all this other stuff. Um, and we said, okay, it's time for them to actually get their hands on some trucks. Let's figure out how we're going to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we sat down with their truck buyer. We talked through what brand they wanted to put it on. They picked a specific manufacturer that they wanted to see the truck installed on or the system installed on. Um, and then we uh, worked with them to get a set of specs for that vehicle that matched the minimum requirements to be able to run self-driving. Uh, and then they ordered that vehicle from the manufacturer, manufacturer shipped it, uh, shipped it out. And then we worked with, uh, we basically worked on the upfit. So the addition of the sensors and the compute mm-hmm. onto those trucks. Uh, and then, uh, and then we're now in the, the late stages of putting them through their paces to be able to be handed over. So doing final validation to hand them over. So okay. you don't install it on trucks that are on the road today. 
you but we also don't build tracks you take you have some level of discretion but there's a minimum bar of capabilities which means you're buying the truck to a certain spec and then adding it on top of a vehicle as it comes off the assembly line nice okay and then you you're the you're charging based on a per mile subscription basis which makes it reoccurring revenue which makes it a really great business model which is I, genius i think what what is sometimes yeah what sometimes lost is people are like wow it's it's like a little bit more expensive to deliver this product than a regular SaaS business because we are uh we have to actually support the truck like there's a person that if the truck gets pulled over that is like there to be able to get get called in live or if the truck gets stuck mm -hmm. to go in live and give it support um and because we have to be able to integrate with all these other places where that's a manufacturer it's real estate but the value created is so much bigger right you think about a typical account for a regular SaaS product it's it's producing you know ten dollars per employee per month that's kind of like the value right right um and so maybe maybe for an entire company you might pay like a small business might pay ten thousand dollars a year or something like that for a SaaS product um we're talking about the value creation of our system being close to a hundred thousand dollars in the in a year per vehicle and so yeah it's like a little bit more expensive to deliver mm -hmm. but the value is so much higher because the comparative the the alternative is not uh excel right the alternative is physically driving a truck which is a, a physical atoms not bits type activity with an order of magnitude higher value per uh like per action so a t even a small account which we don't do small accounts we only do big accounts but hypothetically even a small account with 100 trucks we're talking a seven digit maybe an eight digit account uh for embark and so that makes the the value proposition just so much more compelling right. it's back to what we said at the beginning right you got to make sure that the cost to deliver the product uh is is a lot less than the value that you're creating yeah and this is significantly uh different which is great um what do you think like the next five years looks like for embark so for us it's really about getting this technology commercialized and scaled up so we have a variety of trucks in the fleet today and we have way more customer pre-orders and excitement than we can service today and so really the focus for us is um, getting it so the technology can be handed over to as many as many fleets as uh, as want it, uh, and then seeing that scale up initially across uh, some of the er easier initial lanes. So you won't see it, for example, driving um, in Canada yet, unfortunately, because uh, too snowy. Yeah. Uh, but soon, soon, soon we'll get there as well. Um. Okay. Um. I like it. let's move let's shift a little bit Alex and and just chat more about kind of I think there's a couple things that I read about you and how you see the future and how you uh, practice visualization on a regular basis and and um, focus and like intense focus um, so could you could you dive more into like, maybe let's talk about your daily habits. Like, um, what's a typical day look like for Alex getting up? What time do you go to bed? Uh, types of diets, exercise, mindset, things you like to put in your brain sort of thing. Yeah. So maybe, maybe I'll open with like, I, I don't know that I have, uh, I have this all cracked. <laughs> uh, I, I, I I think that one point I regularly make uh, is that as an entrepreneur, you have to differentiate between uh, pointing in the right direction and then rowing the oars. Okay. And uh, I think a lot of this sort of stuff ends up being about rowing the oars. Like, how do you get the maximum amount of productivity out of yourself as an individual? Mm -hmm. um, but the most important part of entrepreneurship is realizing that it's not mostly about rowing. It's mostly about pointing in the right direction. Um, because if you work really, really hard, but on the wrong thing, 
um, it doesn't matter. And I think that's true at the organizational level as well, right? You need people who are really good at, at helping you row. That's eventually why most companies hire a COO. Uh, but uh, the, the like job of the CEO is really to be really good at pointing. Um, so mm-hmm. uh, as far as like, what does what my day-to-day look like? Um, I'll wake up six to eight, somewhere in there. Oh, there we go. Six to eight. Uh, I'll try to go work out three times a week. Uh, sometimes I get get there on that. Sometimes I don't. Um, and then I'll go to work, uh, get to the office, maybe a bit before nine. Um, I'll stay at the office for eight to 11 hours, go home, go to sleep. It's pretty much, it's pretty much the cycle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't do too much else. <laughs> you try to get to bed at any certain time? I'll get to bed pretty early. Like I'll, I'll get to bed maybe 10 o'clock. And, and any I think sleep's important. I would yeah. argue that, I would argue that, uh, energy more than time is the constraining factor in my, at least for me personally. Yeah. So like sleep, exercise, I, I, I'm I'm 27, so I haven't fully gotten on the diet train yet, but I can see it coming. <laughs> <laughs> what about what about uh, social life? Are you going out, and do you like to you know go out and party, or are you a homebody, or what's your social life like? Um, I like to dance. My friends will tell you I, I love to go out and dance. Nice. Uh, Although I, uh, I, I probably don't do it nearly as much as, as I would in theory like to, uh, but you know, uh, work is, is, uh, probably the main thing by a huge margin. (laughs) What type of dance do you like to do? Anything specific? Oh, like, no, this is like, this is like EDM. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, that's fantastic. What do you think, um, the world should know about Embark that, that, we haven't talked about yet. So I think um, w- one of the really exciting things about what we're doing at Embark is how the technology for trucking is pretty unique, actually, from the technology that's used for cars. Um, and so a lot of people are familiar with robo taxis. And, and a question I'll often get is, how are you different than Google's self driving effort? Yeah. Um, and, and so I think one of the things that's really interesting is. It's not so much that our system is specialized for trucks. It's really that it's specialized for driving outside of the city center. Um, so it's really like focused on highways, right? And you think about where do people where do people actually need robo taxis? It's almost exclusively in city centers. Mm-hmm. And so because of the business model, we operate basically in the opposite set of road types. Um, and what that means is we've built a very unique system. Um, the, the most unique thing is something we call Vision Map Fusion which is basically our truck, instead of using a pre-built map, um, it's able to take its existing map and then make corrections to the map in real time. So you come up on a new construction zone, truck comes up to it, uh, and it's able to recognize what's going on, identify if, for example, even lane markings have been moved, mm-hmm. um, or if there's other things going on in the construction. And then in over the course of 50 milliseconds, it'll take the what it sees on the road, figure out what's going on, compare that to what it has in its map, make corrections, and then be able to drive straight through. Um, and so I think that's something that's really powerful uh, and something that you only really see uh, because we're focusing on the, the highway problem where it's really important. Um, and so I think that's probably something that's very interesting is that the uh, technological design is very different between what you see for, for what we built to focus on self-driving trucks versus what other folks have built that are trying to do a more general purpose solution and do robo taxis. Yeah. The other one would just be how much demand there is for the product. Uh, so we have 14,200 reservations from uh, five of the top 25 truckload carriers in the United States. Uh, and so I think that obviously is something that uh, maybe doesn't surprise too many people, but uh, is very cool that, that we're at that point at this stage. Yeah. Um, what's the longest range that a truck has driven by itself at this point? Uh, so we did a run coast to coast, uh, and there would have been a, a few spots there where it would have handed back to a safety driver, uh, but the, the vast, vast majority of that w- would have been autonomous. We do on a regular basis, we do commercial runs, mm-hmm. uh, 
from in uh, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas areas. Um, and there you'll regularly see the truck go from um, beginning to end without without human involvement at all. It, it, one point will, do you believe, I would imagine this is a yes, but um, do you believe that the trucks will just be driven completely without safety drivers at all? Yes. Yeah. So How far away are that, we from that? So 2024 is driver update. Nice. Nice. And, and then it, there's like simple, silly logistical questions. If a truck, I mean, I guess you would have to fill up a truck with enough fuel or have enough battery to make it from one distance to the other without refilling because it, it, we're not to the technology where the truck can fill itself up <laughs> at the gas station yet, right? So, so we can go about twelve hundred miles on a on a tank of gas. Okay. Um, the U.S. is about three thousand miles across, and so you end up wanting to have a handful of uh, gas stations where there's a guy who'll put the pump in the tank for you, mm -hmm. as long as you can manage to park there. The old fashioned <laughs> style, right? <laughs> That's right. And suddenly, full service is much more important. Yes, exactly. <laughs> What else, man? This is this. I think it's absolutely fascinating. Your guys' story is very inspiring. Um, you know, I love to read it in a book one day. I'm sure it'll be out there. Um, to start from, you know, kids from Canada building a, a self driving golf cart in in high school or college, and then creating, you know, now the longest running self driving trucking company that's out there, right? Like, um, yeah. And, and you're making a huge mark on the world. Like, I think it's absolutely incredibly impressive and then inspiring but at the same time like it just it makes so much sense it's really cool to see um i have a good friend on named austin distal who's one of the owners of uh, jarvis ai uh now called jasper ai um which is basically a um ai that writes that can write books or write copy right they just hit a billion dollar valuation as well and it's like you know, you no longer need in today's world to, to, you need, you no longer need years of business or to, to get into industries where you have to screw other people over to build a company that's so big where you make hundreds of millions or billion, uh, have a billion dollar company. You, now you just need a genius idea and the willing, willingness to do it and the obsession, uh, and excitement to pursue that and not believe that, um, it's impossible. Right, and it sounds like that's what you guys have done. Well, so I'll do. Uh, I'll, I'll give one one contrarian opinion here. Which, okay, fair. Which uh, I think is fun. Um, so a, a thing that commonly will get surprised among people who haven't been in the valley for a long that long yet um, is that when a, when a, a successful company goes public, rule of thumb is the founding team will own maybe twenty percent. Mm -hmm. um, and people are like, oh, 20%, what happened to the rest, right? Like, uh, and of course, most of it's owned by investors. Uh, and so I think there's a, it's somewhat fashionable to bash on investors uh, for ending up having so much economics in some of these successful companies. Um, but I would actually turn it around and say, it's pretty unbelievable that if you go back even 200 years, if you had an idea and you wanted to make a business, you basically had to get the money from your dad or uncle. Friends and family. Uh, yeah. like you had to basically be rich already. Mm -hmm. And so there was a very small group of people, like pretty much just the nobility or the people who were already part of successful families that could even like contemplate starting a business, right? 95% of people in 1700 couldn't start a business no matter what. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, like, I think obviously founders do a huge amount of work. Um, uh, you know, I love, I love our business. I love the technology that we're building. Um, but you know, huge props to the system, uh, that makes it so that, uh, a 20 year old kid from Canada can show up and purely through successively building more and more complete pieces of technology and showing that those work and are at a world-class level just by being a good technologist, build a big business. Um, it's, it's pretty unbelievable. Uh, and it's 
very obvious in my opinion that uh, the capital side of the equation, the ecosystem side of the equation is a huge part of what's responsible for the ability of people like me to build great businesses in America. Well, plus there's so many inspiring, successful entrepreneurs like Peter Thiel, you know, who set up the, the faculties and abilities for, for entrepreneurs to do that, or anybody with an, you know, a, a big idea that wants to change the world and create something like this. I've seen with the other, um, founders that have come on, on the podcast is that they, uh, they don't set out to build a billion dollar company. They set out like yourself to build self-driving trucks and, and then create, um, you know, value to the world and make a difference to the world. And then because the idea is so valuable and the margins are there and the value is there. Right. And, um, then they can do that and they build these amazing softwares, these amazing technologies. Um, we also interviewed, um, Paulo Tiramani, who's built the, uh, the unfoldable houses. Have you seen those boxable from boxable? No. It's like, it's like, um, it's, a uh, now a $3 billion company, but it, their, their idea was, Hey, just like Legos, we can build a house that can fold and unfold. We put it on the back of a truck. It doesn't even need to be a semi. It can be a pickup truck, uh, with a trailer and you can drive it out and then get it off the trailer and you put it on the, on the ground and it unfolds in a matter of an hour, you hook it up, you know, you plug it in, literally has the electricity, bed, cabinets, toilets, everything in there. And it's like, boom, it's done. Um, but it's fascinating. And, and I don't think that would be possible without the, the, the internet and, um, you know, uh, fundraisers and, and investors that are out there really leading the path and pushing the way to, for these companies to make it happen. So, so yeah, my friend. All right, dude. Um, uh, this has been a great podcast, Alex. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience before we sign off? Any, any tips of inspiration or, uh, you'd like to leave for the listeners? I think, uh, I think maybe my parting thought would be when when I got into self-driving, uh, it was because when I look at the big universe of robotics projects, I'm a roboticist, to be mm -hmm. clear. That's <laughs> that's my thing. Um, and when I look at the big universe of, of robotics projects, uh, self-driving sits at that niche where it's it's technically tractable and it has a big enough market with a high enough value to people that you can justify all the effort required to build a great robotics program, mm -hmm. which is way harder than building a great software program. Um, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and I think as you see the technologies, whether it's perception or controls or calibration or actuators that are being developed right now in self-driving and a handful of other places uh, get more and more mature from all the investment that people like us and uh, certainly much larger efforts uh, are doing in the self-driving side is going to unlock an amazing amount of really exciting stuff. Let's call it next decade mm -hmm. uh, where we take all the stuff that's been built for driverless and you start to see it around the home. You start to see it uh, around the store, around the office. Uh, it's going to be pretty transformational. Maybe you'll see robots uh, assembling boxable houses. Yeah. Uh, that'll, yeah. that'll move the ball a lot. So I'm, I think that's, that's what I'm excited about. Like self-driving is going to be absolutely amazing. I took my parents uh, in one of the fully driverless robo taxis this weekend. Uh -huh. uh, and it absolutely blew their minds. Really, uh, and uh, I think you're going to see a heck of a lot more of that in the coming years. I bet your dad was proud, wasn't he? <laughs> he was like, I knew he yeah, added he sure it. Was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll have uh, you know self uh, podcasting podcast. And uh, <laughs> there you gotta watch out. <laughs> that'll be the next thing, then. Dude, Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all of your story with us. It's really inspiring to hear. And, um, you know, it makes me want to dream bigger and do bigger things. And I'm constantly, um, you know, thinking about that and so fortunate to be around people like yourself so I can do that, apply that to my life and send it out to our entrepreneur network that, that they can help themselves as well. But, um, yeah, thank you so much, Alex. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Listeners, we're going to wrap up there. Thank you guys for tuning in once again, and we'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody.